So we will start discussing gravitational waves and full general relativity. And what we saw last time was that uh, uh, we got the universal structure as cry, and that is common to all space time, so that does not have any information about gravitational waves. But there's a next order structure which does, and that next order structure is the derivative operator. And we saw that because um, scry has um, is a null three manifold, and we are working in a divergence free frame. Because of this, mathematically, that null surface has the same properties as a non-expanding horizon and even a weakly isolated horizon. It's not a physically weakly isolated horizon because its properties are with respect to the conformal rescale metric and not the physical metric. But because of that, the statement that we saw last time was that uh, um, on Scry, we have um, uh, an in naturally induced derivative operator. So this is the This is the part F that we're talking about, which is radiant remorse. And we saw that we have the universal structure of these pairs. This guy is null manic, is a null, so this metric is degenerate, etc. And this is common to all space time, but also in the divergence free can form a frame. Scry together with the metric and the exchange curve. And the, uh, the normal up here is mathematically is a shear free, expansion free surface and also geodesic, uh, any uh, geodesic vector field. So mathematically in particular, it is a weakly isolated horizon. And therefore, that means that um, <coughs> the, the weakly isolated horizon structure, there's a mathematical structure of a weakly isolated horizon. And therefore, the, the, the statement is that we have the space time derivative operator, which kills the conformally rescale metric. Uh, so, Gram uses a connection D on Scrap. And this D we saw last time, I mean, just because of the properties of graph, uh, it interacts very well with the universal structure, namely, in any conformal frame, I got G, D, that, and a graph that gives me a derivative operator in any conformal frame. And in that conformal frame, G A annihilates the metric, and D A annihilates also the normal to sky. And therefore, the action of D is rather restricted. And last time we saw that this implies that in fact, um, so we got scry like that, and I got a base space, S. Uh, these are the integral curves of the null vector field. These are topology S2. I got a projection mapping from the integral curves of the null vector fields, the NA vector field, to the base, base space up here. I got S2 mapping up here. And then the statement is that, uh, that in fact, roughly speaking, because of these properties, but the co-vectors which are pulled back, the action of DA is completely determined because it is because of the base space, I got a digit a non-degenerate metric Q bar AB, and I got a derivative operator, which actually is completely determined, and it knows how to operate on co-vectors here. Let's call it um, KA, a co-vector K. So if I have okay, KA bar, and if I pull this co-vector back to co-vector K, it satisfies this condition and the n of k uh, equal to zero. If I just pull it back, so already I know how d bar I operates on it, so I can just pull back the action and I get the same action here. And we saw that just last time explicitly that the action of d um, on um, k. So if you like these Ks, which are tangent to, to these two spheres, like which are linear combinations of M, M and M bar, the action of D on, 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 
uh, on K such that K equal to zero is, is determined. We don't have any freedom here. All the derivative operators, whatever we have, its action on these vectors is determined because, because it kills the metric up here. And the statement is that what is not determined is that the A is determined then by giving the action the A and B action on 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 on, on co vectors L which are that which for which L A and A is not equal to zero, so we might as well just take L A and A is equal to minus one. Uh, we can put anything here which is not, not equal to zero. The simplest thing is to just to choose minus one. So if I know the action on these co-vectors, then I know the derivative completely. So there's a universal structure, but what is different from one space-time to another, from a stationary space-time to a radiative space-time, etc., is this derivative operator, which is induced in any conformal completion um, by, by the space-time derivative operator. We've got a derivative operator D up here. And but however, again, no matter which one, which space time you have, the action of this derivative operator on these covectors is universal, and therefore the only freedom I have got is this. So we're trying to answer the question, how many derivative operators do we have? And that is what now we're, we're, we're going to answer. Okay. Are there any questions? This is where we were. Are there any questions? So, um, so, so now, that, now we want to know how many der such derivative operators are here. So, this, so because I, so how many <coughs> how many derivative operators describe it at beating uh, satisfying these conditions? That's the question that we would like to ask. Because that's the next, next rich, rich structure. So if I take all possible space times, I complete them, I put them, put the structure on the, the derivative operator on scratch, how many are there? Right? There are many, so how many are there? Well, so I can take dA minus d prime a minus dA, two derivative operators, operate on any uh, vector omega a, say, and a co covector omega b, and that is going to be, of course, of the type C, A, B, C omega c. This is, maybe I should not call it omega, let me give, give it some other name. Okay, then, um, alpha. Um, B, alpha c. Because omega, some, little omega sometimes we use it, the conformal factor, so let's not use that. So we got this, so there's, given any two connections, the difference between them is a tensor, and that tensor is CABC. These connections are torsion free, so <coughs> CABC um, just satisfies that it's symmetric. Now, if I just take this property that on k's, which are such that k dot n is equal to zero, then in fact the derivative operator is universal. So if I take now k such that k dot n equal to zero, there's a covector. And again, all these equations are on sky, therefore I'm not putting hat on all equations. Every equation, if you like, has a hat. Um, then then I, I must get here d prime a minus dA operating with kb. They all agree, so this must be equal to zero. But this, of course, is just equal to cabc times kc. That means if you give me any k, which is transverse to n, so it's in the two sphere directions, if you like, d by d theta, d by d phi directions, then in fact the derivative operators agree. Therefore, the contraction of cabc with something like this is always zero. That it just implies immediately that C A B C has the form some tensor sigma A B times N C. Because the only thing that will kill every covector which is perpendicular to N is N. Not very profound. So therefore, th this must have the form sigma A B C times N C, where sigma A B is now is symmetric up here. But we also know that D A of N B equal to zero. So that would immediately imply, again, uh, this is true, dA, d prime a minus dA of nB is zero, because d of nB is equal to zero, d prime a nB equal to zero, so this also equal to zero. Um, 
and this is just equal to C A D C times uh, uh, infinity. So it is minus C A B C times N C. Uh, this is a co-vector, this is a contra-vector, that's why there is a minus sign. And the only the indices are the only way that you can write down. Uh, N is up, B is an upstairs index, and A is a downstairs index, and then we have a contraction up here. So we know that this is equal to zero. So this is but this is just equal to sigma A B times uh, so sigma A C times N C. So sigma A C times N C times N B. So I'm just substituting for C A B C from here. The index the indices are slightly different, but that's what we get. And so therefore immediately we find that that sigma is transverse to n sigma b equal to zero. So how many derivative operators are there? Well, there are as many derivative operators as there are symmetric second rank tensors transverse to m up here. So as many these as sigma a b, where sigma a b is symmetric. And it's transverse to n. So we got a three manifold. This just says that sigma a b, if you like, has components only among m and m bar. It's only the other. It's transverse components, and therefore there really is a two-dimensional tensor. No, not a three-dimensional tensor because it's transverse up here. Or if you like, sigma a b is a symmetric tensor field. And this transversality condition kills three of the components, and therefore I'm just left with three components. So therefore this is three, um, three components. You can spe freely specify three components. And we use all the equations. This way you use directly. And this equation DAQBC equal to zero is automatically implied by the fact that uh, that d minus d prime operating k is equal to zero if k is of this type because q is of course of this type therefore they all agree on q so, this, so we use all the equations and the statement is that we are left with this kind of three free functions of um, on, on scrum that you can specify however there's a there's a catch and this is a subtle catch uh, but it's, it's, it's more or less obvious that what we have here in physical space time is really a conformal metric G A B, which then induced Q A B and N A. So what happens under conformal transformations? Well, in general, of course, Q changes and 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 N also changes. Q changes and N also changes up here in general under conformal transformation. But what happens if, in fact, I choose omega to be such that it is not equal to one in the interior, but on square it is equal to one. So supposing I choose, make a conformal transformation, G A B goes to G prime, or maybe G bar A B. Let me just make the rotation because I think I, prime and bars are used in, yeah. This D prime A B was just any old or derivative operator, so let me not use prime up here. So G bar A B, and supposing this is equal to omega squared and G A B. And supposing omega is of course always smooth, and in general, because we're in a conformal frame, uh, in a divergence free conformal frame, Li and omega is zero, it's only a function of theta and phi. But suppose that in fact omega is equal to one on square. I'm putting this hat now here because this is a space-time equation, and this is an equation just on scry. So anytime there's a need, I will put the hat. If there's no need, I'm not put hat. So up to here, there's no need. So if you like every equation is a hat up here, I just didn't put it. But now I'm intermingling what is happening in space time with what is happening at scala. Therefore, I put this on the to one. So if I just do this, then of course, Q bar AB is equal to omega squared times QAB. It's just QAB and and N A and bar AB and bar A omega is equal to N A. So in that case, this frame doesn't change. But does the derivative operator change? First, once the reaction would be no, the derivative operator would not change because the frame didn't change. But that would be correct if, in fact, the derivative operator was completely determined by this metric and the extrinsic curvature. But it's not. There are infinitely many derivative operators up here, which means that if omega is equal to 1 on scry, but its derivative of scry is not equal to 1, then the metric and the null normal don't know anything about it. 
but the derivative operator, which probes one order deeper, knows about it. So under this transformation, what happens to grad prime A? So grad A, sorry, grad A. So grad A will go to grad prime. Will go to grad A. Okay, so grad A of G B C equal to zero. Grad A of G bar B C equal to zero. These are the two torsion free derivative operators related to, related to each other. And you can easily check what the conformal transformation property is. And the only thing that you have to always remember is the sign. Yeah. So the statement is that you are broad, you are um, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Minus the A of any, uh, any vector uh, alpha. Again, this is in space time now. This is in space time. So this any vector alpha up here, so you work out the transformation, conformal transformation property. We have seen that you know, a few times before. Um, it's also, for example, in the appendix in the Wall's book, how the, how the if they make a conformal transformation of the metric, how the derivative of the changes, how the curvature tensor changes, and so on. And so that, therefore I just get here minus, so this is equal to C A B C. Uh, alpha C, and this C A B C is just equal to minus omega to the minus one times delta A C uh, B omega. So it's symmetric in A and B. So therefore, I just symmetrize here, put a two, and minus uh, C omega times G. So if I just Make a conformal transformation, the derivative operator changes, and it changes by this particular formula. And therefore, if I take CABC times alpha C, in general, I will obtain this times alpha C up here. What I'm interested in is what happens to d bar A minus d A operating on alpha B. This is what I'm interested in. Um, where alpha b is now just in within scry, within scry. So supposing I just take the pullback of all this thing to scry, therefore I'm taking, so this is what I would like to know, so this of course equal to d bar a, so, sorry. This is uh, grad bar a minus grad a alpha b. I pull back up this equation to scry, then grad bar pull back will give me some d bar, grad, grad pull back will give me d, and then I'll get pulled back up alpha b. This is what I'll get. So here alpha is in space time, and that is why uh, the one source cry will be pulled back. But this is exactly what we saw. Um, so we can just find out what that is. So that it is this. That, so that will be equal to omega to the minus one times twice delta A C gonna be of omega. And this is pulled back on to scry. On, on indices A and B, this is pulled back to square in indices A and B minus grad C omega times alpha C times G A B pulled back to omega. So I've just taken here, sorry, I've taken alpha C inside, so, so this operating on alpha is going to be equal to. Um, it is going to be equal to alpha, alpha is pulled back, and then I got this thing, and then here the finishes A and B are pulled back, and I will obtain, uh, so I, I, I don't have to pull back alpha. Well, we're just pulling back the indices A and B, we're just pulling back the indices A and B. Okay. Um, so, so this is what it is, right? The, the difference between the two derivative operators is equal to this. But we just looked at the possibility in which omega is equal to 1 on scalar. So if omega is equal to one on sky, then of course this is just one. This is a derivative operator operating on omega, and I'm pulling back to sky. So this is just the derivative of the of omega within sky, but omega is constant on sky, therefore this is equal to zero. And I'm just left with this term, therefore I just, this term is just going to be equal to, so there was a minus sign that I missed here, minus omega minus one. So this minus sign and this minus sign becomes plus, and then I get here just alpha c times grad c of omega times. So what we find is that in this case, this tensor C A B C, if you like, 
has some very specific form operating on any, any alpha, it is of the type, I, what I get is really something which is proportional to the metric up here. But now, the point is that if omega is equal to 1 on scry, that immediately implies that if I take in the physical space time, um, so I should again be careful, so I'm, this is equal to, pull back up this is equal to that one, so I should put hats, these equations are, are all hats up here. So omega is equal to 1 on scry, that means that grad omega is proportional to n. Because if I take a function which is constant on scry, and it's any function inside, and I take its gradient, that gradient should be normal to, to scry, because omega is on scry, uh, is it okay or is it not okay? I'm given a submanifold, I'm given a function which happens to be constant on scry, but not constant inside, and the submanifold is actually constant. Therefore, its gradient should be proportional to normal to scry. Right? You have any function which is constant on the submanifold, is gradient is always normal to the sub manifold. And therefore, this is proportional to n. So therefore, we find this to be equal to some, some function f times uh, alpha c and c. So if I just put in this language, we just find here that dA minus dB of alpha uh, alpha dA minus dB, d bar a minus dA of alpha b and any alpha which is put back to scry up here, this quantity is again is equal to in general six sigma C A B C times alpha C, and therefore that is of the type sigma A B times A C times alpha C. And this what we are seeing is that this is of the type um, um, so, so this is of the type F times uh, alpha C and C times, there's not pull back, sorry. It's just alpha C and C times Q. So what we find is that that means that sigma IB in this case is just F times a metric. So this is a short calculation which addresses the following problem, a following issue. The issue is that I can have conformal transformations in the physical space time under which the space-time metric changes. But the relative confounded factor into omega that we have could be equal to 1 at scra. It's not 1 everywhere. Its derivative of scra is not equal to 1, but it just happens to be 1 at scra. If so, then it does not change the confounded metric in the normal to scra. But in the physical space-time, it still changes the derivative operator. Because it doesn't change the metric here, but the derivative operator knows also what the metric is doing off scra. Therefore, it changes the derivative operator. And it changes the derivative operator by the formula that we wrote down. But because omega is equal to 1 on scry, in fact, the derivative operator change. It just, this term is the only one that survives. It's proportional to the GAB metric. If I pull it back to scry, therefore, the, the two derivative operators differ from each other by sigma times and C, alpha C, where sigma AB is just equal to some function times QAB. So what we had seen before was that given any two derivative operators, they differ from each other by the sigma AB, which has three components. Now what we know, notice is that the trace of the sigma AB is pure gauge. Because say Javier has a confirmed completion, and he finds his dA, and his finds perfectly fine up here. And then Jesus finds another confirmed completion, but they, they all agree at scry, omega is equal to one, but he will obtain a different derivative operator, and the two will differ by, uh, by, by this formula, d prime minus dA is equal to sigma AB, uh, sigma AC and C times, uh, sorry, uh, will, will, yeah, C A B C times NC, or sigma AC times C, okay. <laughs> they will differ by the sigma AB term, and that sigma AB term is just a symmetric term here, in general. But in this particular case, they will find the sigma AB just proportional proportion to the metric. That means I can change sigma AB by making a gauge term, by making a conformal transformation. And conformal transformations don't have information about the physical metric, because the physical metric has not changed. The only its description in terms of the conformal completion has changed. And with that conformal transformation, the statement is that this, this sigma AB changes, and therefore that is gauge. So this sigma AB 
does characterize the difference between any two derivative operators, but part of the sigma AB is just fluff, is, is gauge, it's just mathematical thing that happens because one chose one con conformal completion and another person chose another con conformal completion. So the statement up here is that the trace part of sigma is pure gauge. So the trace free part is where the gauge invariant information is. So the so we're saying that the uh, trace free part. So I take sigma AB and the, I can take the trace QAB and this quantity is, is really going to be F here um, or, or half F. So this will be equal to half F because if I take sigma AB times QAB, sigma AB equal to that, QAB, QAB will be equal to two because it's a two-dimensional metric. And therefore, this, this is pure gauge. Note that, that QAB, you have some freedom. QAB could go to QAB plus some V A and B, T A and B, where T A is any vector tangential to, to square. But this condition, it doesn't change because sigma is already transversal to N. So I can choose any inverse here, doesn't matter which inverse I choose. So its trace can be taken with respect to any inverse metric, and the statement is that that is pure gauge. So the gauge invariant part if you like, we can just call it equivalence classes of map. D is up here. These are the D's. D is equivalent to D prime if sigma AB which relates them is equal to f times is proportional to the metric. So this, the gauge invariant part of, of these equivalence classes of connections, this is actually it turns out that this in course. So how many components does this does this have? So if I take now d bar minus d, so this I can change the take the, the difference between the equivalence classes, difference between individual d's was characterized by sigma, therefore the difference between the equivalence classes is characterized by trace-free part of sigma. So sigma AB minus one half VAB times sigma C, sigma C D times C D is the trace-free part. And let us call the trace-free part. This is the trace-free part of sigma. Let us call it, let us call it this little sigma AB. So the gauge. I mean, how many derivative operators are there? Well, there really is as many as there are three functions on the scribe, because the sigma ID has three components, but one of them is gauge. So how many gauge invariant degrees of freedom are there in the der derivative operator? How many connections are there, which are sort of not, not contaminated by just trivial re conformal rescalings with omega equal to one on scribe? The answer is that it is really the trace-free part up here. Because I removed trace, this has two components. And these are the radiative modes of the gravitation field. And we'll see a little bit more detail, but when you see this LIGO plots and all those waveforms, what they're plotting is this, the component of the sigma. So I'll explain in a minute a little bit more exactly what they're plotting. So these are the just these two components up here. So in other words, You've got two binary black holes which are you know, radiating, uh, which are rotating around and they collapse and they merge, they form a single binary black hole, then they send out some ripples in like space-time curvature. Then what changes at, at SCRI is the derivative operator. The metric does not change, the non-normal does not change, but the derivative operator changes. And that change in the derivative operator, sort of the physical part, the gauge invariant part, is contained in the sigma. And, and th it is this sigma that registers the gravitational waves, and that is what is plotted in, 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 in the plots, in the, uh, in, the, in the LIGO papers. Okay, so a little bit more. So what properties does sigma AB have? Let me write down again. Sigma AB, big sigma AB was transverse. The little sigma AB is big sigma AB plus something times the metric. The metric is also killed by N. Therefore, big sigma AB, little sigma AB is also transverse. Of course, by construction, 
sigma AB is symmetric and it is straight straight. So it is transverse to N. The non normal to N. It is symmetric and it is straight straight. So this is called the transverse, symmetric transverse straight sweep. You know, the, the, these modes are the modes of, these are the two modes, two AD and AD, two modes. Of the gravitational field. In full general relativity, in the asymptotically flat context that we're studying up here. So this is the thing that I want to sort of emphasize now, and now we want to understand the properties of this thing called sigma up here. Are there any questions about this? There are exactly two invariant co quantities that I've extracted out of the derivative operator, and the rest I just told you, and we're going to see why all this is, uh, is true, right? This is fine, but why these are the radiative modes, that's what we, we're now going to see. Is this your other question? Good. No. Um, I think we started with choosing first the divergence free conformal frame, and then you know, everything else is in that frame. Right? Yeah, everything is in that frame. So, should we not, had, had we not chosen that divergence free frame, could we still recover basically? Right. right, because the statement is that if you like, it is like partial fixing the conformal freedom. If I kept the full conformal freedom, then there's more, you'll get more components here. So this equation would not be just simple like that, but then that, those, more, there's more gauge and more equations. And we're killing some gauge early on because in some sense it is irrelevant, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's a matter of convenience, it's not. Uh, and we're going to, in fact, as we see did last time, uh, in order to talk about translations and so on, we can further fix the conformal freedom. We want just to simplify mathematics, not because it is necessary, you can do it without that. But the divergence free conformal frame is something that really does cut, cut the clutter a lot. If you, if you remove that condition, there are just all kinds of extra terms which don't carry any physics, which you have to keep everywhere. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those two modes form, let's say, in a particular gauge. Um, uh, no, so this, I mean, other than in, in, in space time language, in a particular. Uh, is this the kind of thinking to the linearized theory one? Yeah, one so we're going to. The TT gauge, you know, the so, so we're going to see the connection of linearized theory. Ah. Because the way that I organize this, this course was pur purposely like this, maybe. Namely, I, most students have taken the first course in general relativity, so they have seen linearized gravity, so they're already familiar with it. So I didn't want to start with that. But rather, I wanted to show the exact theory and then take its linearization so that they can see that that is really the same as what is happening up here. And then we're going to talk about uh, the, the, the transverse stress gauge in the linearized theory, how it is related, and that, that, that is what we're going to do just now. But at the moment, the statement is from the space time point of view, I've not fixed any gauge except by being on scrap. So I, I'm not saying that, that I mean, I might feel like I'm assuming that the metric is such that it, is, it has sufficient smoothness on scrap. That, this come to, come, that you satisfy the boundary conditions we wrote down. And then there was a, it's not like this space time transfer space that's gauge, but there's a conformal freedom which is spurious. So, in that sense, it is gauge, it does not have any information about physics because I change, I keep the space time metric the same, but the conformal com metric changes just because of, I chose chosen to do a conformal completion. And, and what, what we're seeing up here is really un under that what is happening. And then the statement is that these two modes. Are gauge invariant, they don't change anything. Okay, and, and the, the way that I'm doing it this way is also, I think, appropriate because looking, ma making the contact with linearized theory then opens door to cosmology because that's how the cosmological perturbations are done. So that's why I, I, I'm doing it in this particular way. Okay, and this is the question that you had asked some time ago about what is the relation with cosmology, and we're going to see today and next time what the relation is. All right. So these are the two radiative modes. Now, just having said that those are the two radiative modes, radiative modes, what is it that I can do with that? So the first thing is the following, that we would like to have some, somehow tie them down 
more directly with something with some geometry. This is already a geometrical quantity, but with the geometrical quantities that we are familiar with, like the Newman Penrose tetrarchs and so on, that we have done so far. So let us try to do that. Um, today I'm going to put the homework on the, the first homework on gravitational waves, and also perhaps second. There will be two homeworks on gravitational waves, and the, the first one will be due a week from today, uh, on the next uh, next Wednesday. Also, I should just remind everybody that they should be thinking about possible projects for term papers. The term papers are short, between five and ten pages, not much longer. But if you think about them, they will be due at the end of the month when our semester is officially over. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll arrange presentations, uh, short presentations on those topics the first week, which is the exam week. So we'll meet together and we'll do some short presentations. We'll choose a time uh, of time mutual convenience. And finally, on the administrative matters, as you all know that I'm going to make up the class that we missed last Wednesday, I'm going to make it, make it up next Friday. Next Friday, we don't have a reg regular seminar here, so I, we, can, I, we can meet, uh, I, I can I'll make up that, that class. Okay, so now let's continue about this radiative Morse. So, let us suppose that I got scry. This is to cross R, scry going to be, now I got MA. And as we saw before, what I can do is I can choose a cross section, let me call it C1, C2. And once I choose a cross section, I acquire, I've chosen this C1, I acquire the null normal and LA to it, such that, L, such that if I take this cross section, and if I take a vector which is, um, let me call it T under bar A, which is tangential to this cross section, then this will be zero. So this is the other normal, and of course it is always going to be the case that, um, uh, yeah. So, so this is a the, 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 so this is a vector which is actually tangential to to, to this cross section. So L refers to a cross section. I don't have a canonical L. I have a canonical n, contravariant n that is given to me, but I don't have a canonical L. You choose a cross section, I get L. We saw this before when we looked at the newman penrose framework. All right. Then what I said before was that, well, we can just parallel transport LB equal to zero. And then if I, or when I do that, I get L everywhere. And I can also look at um, a fine parameter of n vector field. And these vector field, these cross sections C1, C2, C3, etc., will all be related. This will be u equal to u, u1, u equal to u2, u equal to u3. These are the affine parameter is going to be this constant along this. Uh, so if you give me a cross section, then using the vector field n that we got, the structure we got, we can introduce, as we saw before, we can introduce a null co uh, coordinate n, n, so one, a coordinate u which is the affine parameter of this vector field I have here. And u equal to constant will give me these preferred cross sections to which this vector field L, or the co-vector field L, is going to be transverse. And the co-vector field L is just parallel propagated by, L, by, by the vector field N everywhere. OK, so we've got these equations. Um, so now, what we saw before was, so in particular, it is true that um, that, that uh, because of this, it, 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 is going to, it is true that LA, LA, we just chose it to be equal to say minus one. I just chose LA and A to be equal to minus one, and then I propagate it, and then I get that. So this is what we had done when we had constructed the newman penrose tetras everywhere. So this means that LA, this LA, which is transverse to a cross section, a co-vector which is transverse to a cross section, can serve as our L, which really determines the derivative operator. So recall that the derivative operator is completely specified. By giving DA and B, because LA and A equal to minus one is no, no way vanishing. 
And therefore, once I know its action on L, then I know its action on everything else, because its action on the vectors which are tangential to the cross sections up here is universal. It's just the action of a two sphere derivative operator. So we get here dA and B. There's no problem with that. But that once I know the L, I can just cal cal calculate the dA and B, and that completely determines the, the, the derivative operator. And what this sigma does for us, this sigma that we talked about does for us is the following, that I can just take the trace free part of this L, I can just take the trace free part of this L and that can be identified with the sigma AB. Now you might say, why is this the case? I mean, this is a tensor, and that tensor can be identified with sigma AB. Over here, what sigma AB was, was the difference between two physical derivative operators. Here it looks like I only have the, 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 phys the one physical derivative operator, D, up here. So what is, it, what is happening up here? But what is happening is that, given D, given L, you can always define a fiducia derivative operator, D, D naught, such that D naught and LB. This determines what D naught is completely, and this just equal to zero. So I can define, so to say, a derivative operator which curvature is trivial by, by making D naught and LB equal to zero. Since specify, specifying the action of the derivative, derivative operator on L determines the derivative operator completely, if I just tell you that this is equal to zero, then I get a particular derivative operator. This derivative operator will have trivial curvature. And we're going to say a little bit more about this at the moment. So sort of more as obvious that the curvature is going to be trivial up here. Um, and so, um, such a, so, so, so this, if you like, is a fiducial derivative operator. And then the sigma AB, that I've defined up here, I can take it to be, so I can first now take da minus d naught a and b. This, of course, is going to be equal to sigma a b, big sigma a b, times a given any two derivative operators, and the, the difference is big sigma a b times n c and b. And this is just equal to minus 1, therefore, this is just equal to minus sigma a b. The difference between these two derivative operators is just minus sigma a b up here. And now, Oh, so, yeah, I should have. Okay. Uh, I, I, I made a mistake here. Namely, sigma AB is, I, I just told you that DA and B, and you can calculate the shear of this L vector field, which is really taking this derivative and removing the trace up here. But there is minus sign that I, I missed. So it's minus sigma AB, or so if you like, sigma AB is equal to minus on the right, on the right hand side, whichever you would prefer, is equal to minus. Sigma idea I to told you about it there, minus of this. So, so we say dA minus d naught a b is equal to capital sigma a b, and but this of course is the same as dA and b, right? Because d naught a and b by definition is equal to zero. So the statement is that if you give me a cross section and then I just define the covector fields L A everywhere up here by just dragging parallel transporting thing along L, I get a whole bunch of cross sections. And the statement is that given this bunch of cross sections, we acquire kind of a fiducial derivative operator very trivially by just setting that D naught A just kills this L. Every derivative operator is specified by its action on L, and I just say that, well, let's take the simplest case, it will kill it. Then I get a derivative, fiducial derivative operator. This fiducial derivative operator is tied to the choice of my cross sections or choice of the initial cross-section, because subsequent ones are completely different. And then the statement is that the DA, and then therefore, since this is equal to this, it follows that the trace-free part of this quantity is equal to the trace-free part of this, which is sigma. Okay, let me summarize once again, and please ask questions, because people look a little bit puzzled. So please ask questions if you have, yeah. This is a couple of there, so. Yes, this is. NCL. Thank you. And there is C and D, right, also, in the, in the for, for sigma? The, okay, so, so. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for these corrections. That's correct. Right. It should be CD. So there are some other questions. Okay. So what I'm saying is the following. That what we saw here was without just take a scry, look at all possible space time, look at the derivative operators, we acquired them. And we see that two derivative operators are equivalent if in fact the difference is given by sigma, which is pure trace. Therefore, the gauge invariant part is the trace free part of the sigma. That's what we saw. Second thing I say is that, well, supposing you give me a scry and I choose a cross section. Given this cross section, I'm, there's always a, non, a, a normal L to this cross section that I get. Um, because th this is a three dimensional manifold, you give me a cross section up here, and this L up here, given any sub manifold, I always have covariant normal. So we just choose the covariant normal, and we choose the co normalized of the covariant normal so that LA and A is equal to minus one. And then the statement is that when you do that, what you will obtain, what you will obtain is really a family of cross sections which are sort of parallel transported by the vector field NA, and the affine parameter U is equal to constant up here. So you get a nice slicing or foliation of scry by U equal to constant surfaces. And given every of these surfaces, I got a vector vector L, a co-vector L, which is normal to it. And if I take the shear of this co-vector, because this quantity taking the derivative and then taking it, removing its trace, that is the shear. So the shear of this vector field can be reinterpreted as saying that it is the difference between the given physical derivative operator and a trivial derivative operator, where the trivial derivative operator is constructed using this specification of cross section. So given L, I get a bunch of cross sections, and then I'm taking sigma, uh, taking the shear of this. Maybe I should use some other notation here, let me call it sigma up here, which is bold phase sigma. The bold phase sigma is a shear, and what we are seeing here is that this bold phase sigma, that the trace free part of this, so the trace free part of sigma AB is what I call sigma there. And the equation, this equation says that the, the geometrical shear of this L is the same as the trace free part of this big sigma, where the big sigma is the difference between these two derivatives. And so often, this sigma is called the shear, asymptotic shear. So again, the waveforms, if you like, are really coded in this asymptotic shear. Now, because of the properties of the sigma, which is that it is symmetric, transverse, and traceless, sigma is so. I'm, from now on, I'm dro dropping the distinction between the more first one and this one because they're equal to each other. So I'm dropping this dis distinction. So sigma AB times MB equal symmetric, transverse, and traceless. So because of these properties, it follows immediately that if I were to use this Newman Penrose type null tetras, so that I choose here mn and bar as being the, the, the vectors which are tangential, right? this is the net tetra that we constructed a while ago while talking about various components of the wide curvature. Then it follows that I can expand our sigma in B in terms of mn and bar. So first of all, it will have no L component um, because it is really a transverse and traceless. So therefore, this can be expanded just as some quantity times an A. And for some reason, one puts a bar and minus. That that's convention in, uh, in the in literature. Sigma bar naught times M A and B plus sigma naught times M bar A and bar B. So the only other terms could have been M A, M bar B, but this is pure trace, and I don't have trace up here, so because of this condition, there is no term like that. And because it is transverse, I cannot have terms of the type M A, L B, or M bar A, L B. I cannot have terms like that, because then if I transvect with N, it will hit L, and I need a non-zero answer. I need to get zero. 
So this is the condition because this is the trace-free condition tells me that that this is zero and I don't have terms like that because of transversality. So if you like this sigma ID, you can think of it as being living on this cross section, just an intrinsic cross section up here, and it can be expanded out in this particular way. And therefore, this is often called, uh, this sigma naught is often called shear. Uh, so shear uh, function. So shear, but this is a spin weighted function. It has spin weight because of, because of this m bar m bar. This has no spin weight. This has spin weight minus two, therefore this has spin weight two. So this shear, shear function with spin weight two. And in the literature, you always often find the sigma naught. And then in the waveforms that you get in LIGO, what is one is plotting is a real and imaginary part of the sigma naught. That's what is being plotted, plotted in the in the left line. So this is a spin two part of the waveform. There's a real imaginary part of the sigma naught. Okay. So the next thing that we we we, we should do is um, uh, understand. So what we have seen so far is that we have got these derivative operators and morally it is these derivative operators or if you like the gauge invariant part of these derivative operators that capture the radiative modes. But now we would like to understand better um, the interplay between geometry and physics. Because on the geometrical side, if you give me a derivative operator, the first thing anybody would do is to commute the derivative operators and calculate the curvature tensor. And then on the physics side, we would like to know what is the relation between the curvature tensor of these of this derivative operators and the, uh, and, and, and the observable physical quantities. So I'm, I'm not doing it logically. I'm just giving it because, in the, because of efficiency. I'm sort of say, mathematically, I've told you what the derivative operators are. And if you like, I just whisper in your ears that the, this is the information about the radiative, radiative modes. And then we're going along. And we're going to get more and more reason why these are the two radiative modes, if you like. So just keep this in mind, and at the end of the day, if you like, you can say logically why these were the two radiative modes. At the moment, I'm just going back and forth between physics and mathematics. Mathematics, I'm doing systematically. Physical things, I'm just telling you ahead of time what the interpretation is. Okay, so now we, we get this uh, say, but Now, the the Next thing that we would like to do is to calculate the curvature. What information does this curvature have? Of course, ultimately what we want is to calculate the curvature of the equivalence class of D. But to begin with, let's calculate the curvature of D. Which means that there will be some part of the curvature which will be invariant under this conformal freedom. And that is the one which has physical meaning. The rest doesn't have physical meaning. So curvature. So we just take 2 times dA dB times alpha c, and this will be equal to the Riemann tensor. Now we have expanded on this in, in four dimensions several times, in terms of the wild part and the Ricci part. But in three dimensions, just the symmetry of the wild tensor tell you that there is no wild tensor. And that is the reason why in three if I were space-time were three-dimensional, then there are no gravitational waves. Gravitational waves come into existence only in four dimensions and, and higher. So here, of course, we are in four space-time dimensions, but scry is three-dimensional. And so mathematically, the curvature tensor, the Riemann tensor up here, can be expanded out just using that there is no wild part to this curvature tensor. So we can just expand it out. And that, that is, I just want to get the sign right. Okay. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, yes, I can. So this can be expanded out as QAC. This is all on sky. I'm not putting hats everywhere because everything is on sky. So every equation should have had. So the Riemann tensor is just determined by this S tensor. There's no in the four dimensions there will be plus the y tensor term, and we don't have that y tensor term. And this S tensor, SAB up here, 
Oh, okay. So, so, and then I, I got two tensors up here. Which is the one is the SID with one down, one mapping index structure. And this is the tens this, this is really the curvature of information up here. And then I got with these, these indices up here. And this is just obtained, as you might imagine, SIC is just equal to SCD, uh, sorry, SCD, SCD. So I'm lowering the index with this metric, degenerate metric Q. Because the metric has signature plus, 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 it's not a non-degenerate metric. Therefore, some information is lost in lowering the, 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 the index up here. So if you like, the full information about the curvature in the second rank tensor with one up and one down in this index. However, in the full formula, I also have SC, SCA, where it's both downstairs indices. And this tensor has slightly less information than this tensor. So I just keep this in mind, and then we, go, we proceed up here. And now the statement is that I can take this SCA downstairs tensor, and I can extract gauge invariant part of it, or confirmable invariant part of it. Now, how do we do this? The simplest way, I'm just telling you facts, and there are calculations which will justify this fact, but those are reasonably long calculations. Um, that conformal invariant part can be obtained as follows. Go to a body frame that fixes the conformal factor almost all completely. Go to a bond frame. You're only given the three parameter family of freedom, bond conformal frame. So the metric is that of a round metric. So the QAB is a unit to square metric. And in that frame, you just take the trace part. It's somewhat not so surprising because we saw here the trace part is always has gauge information. And it's true here too that what I do is I just subtract the gauge part. So this SCA, by definition, uh, has a property that if I put N into it, I'll get zero. And so I take here SCA minus uh, one half times Q and and SMN times QC. Just take the trace free part of this S in the body conformal frame. And the statement is that this is conformal invariant. So if in fact Ong Chao you chooses to use one bondy frame up here. And Song uses to choose another boundary frame. They are, they, are, they are three parallel family of them, and they calculate this quantity. This quantity will not change. This quantity is conformally invariant. I'm just stating this, uh, but it is a straightforward calculation to check that this is the case by making conformal transformations explicitly. And so the statement is that SAB minus one half SMN. Maybe this is confirmably invariant. I, I'm in the bonding frame, and therefore it just remove the trace. There's also a uh, procedure to do it in a general conformal frame, but it's much more complicated to write down the formula. It's much larger. Yeah. Okay, so how do you state the? Um, I used to yeah. miss something. S that n is zero. Yeah. So <laughs> because you're right. So the point is that this S up here. This is a tensor. I should have written down all these properties. Uh, I did not. S A B has a property that S A B and B is equal to some function times N. So N A is equal to some function times N B. This S has this property. And therefore, when I lower the index with one index, then the statement is that, um, the, the, and that was the statement. So, so, so S A B and B will be zero because of that. Is a property for this thing. And so, it, it's not, I mean, you have to play around a little bit. It's not pretty profound. It's just ordinary differential geometry in three dimensions. It is some, you know, you just have to play with the algebraic symmetry. It's not very, very deep. I'll, I'm going to give references also in the, in the, on the web page up here. So, if I take SAB minus one of this thing, so this quantity is NAB, and this is called the Bondi new tensor. So this body news tensor, we'll see why it's important in a minute. This body news tensor has information about uh, about the, the, in, the invariant information about the curvature of D up here. 
Again, this body new tensor by construction is symmetric. It is again transverse. This body new tensor is symmetric and transverse and stressless. Again, it's symmetric transverse traceless again up here. So you might say, well, is there some relation between this sigma and this the body new tensor? And the idea and answer is yes. This body new tensor is just the time derivative of that sigma. In other words, an A B is just the n of, of, um, of sigma A. I can calculate sigma in this particular way. It is really shear of these L vectors. And then the statement is I can take n, and that is the time derivative. So if you like, sometimes people just write it as sigma dot ab. So, or sometimes people expand out nab also as n times um, m bar a m bar b, n bar times m a and b, plus n times m bar a m bar b. And then the statement is like n dot. Is just equal, so n is just equal to sigma dot. Because six, six, sigma dot. For some reason, one puts a knot here, but for the body news function, then one does not put a knot. One could logically just put a knot if you like, just to be consistent, and then you put a knot up here, and then that is the body. So basically, the time rate of change of the shear is the body news. And we're running out of t time a little bit, but let me just state the results that will make the overall structure complete. And the next time I'll begin with a grand summary, then we'll start with cosmology. So now we got this body news tensor. And now finally, well, two, two points. The first point is that we can now ask for properties of gravitational waves, physical properties of gravitational waves. And this again is a beautiful interplay between physics and geometry. We'll see that the energy carried by the gravitational waves, and the momentum carried by gravitational waves, is completely determined by this new tensor. For the in the in the old literature with Bondi and even with Penrose and Newman and various things, people always dealt with n and with sigma, with these spin weighted functions up here, and this was called the news function. But in fact, this news function geometrically is not a function. News is a tensor. And furthermore, this tensor is really a curvature tensor. So this was something that I found much, much later uh, in the 80s, that in fact, there's a very geometrical, nice interpretation of the Bondi news that really, it really is a tensor of the intrinsic derivative operator on scry and the property of the forward. Then supposing we want to find out how much energy is carried and how much momentum is carried by gravitational waves. Now notice that we don't have a really stationary tensor for gravitational waves. So how are we going to calculate it? So we had two problems when we transited from electrodynamics to gravity. The first problem was that we didn't have any symmetries. Energy is a generator of time translations. Momentum is a generator of space translations. We now have actually resolved that because at Scry, we do know what time translation means and space translation means. Or we know what translations mean, if you like. And any given body frame, the time translation is just the vector field Na, and the, the space translation are the first three YLMs. Space translations are alpha times Na, where in the body frame, alpha will just be equal to cos theta for the z directional translation, and will be equal to um, sine theta, sine phi for the y directional translation. These are just the projections of you know the vector r along the z axis and the unit vector the, the r cos theta. So if it's unit, then it's a cos theta. This is a projection on the y on the y axis, and this will be the projection along x axis. I explained to you this last time that the translations, BMS group admits a four-dimensional translation subgroup, 
And one way to characterize is to go to the body frame and just look at the first four YLMs. Of course, if you are in Minkowski space, in Minkowski space, you do know what translations are. And if you look at their, them at infinity and use a conformal completion in the body frame, then these are exactly the vectors that we obtain. They're all parallel to n, but this is, so to say, pure time translation in that particular body frame. And then this is really a z-directional translation, y-directional translation, and x-directional translation. So we know what the translations are. So we are asking, what are the generators of these space-time translations? We don't have stress in tensor. But what we can do is we can construct, we're not going to do it in class, but I just state it. We can construct a synthetic space on a phase space of radiative U boards from scratch, so to say, from first principles, because we know that the space of solutions to Einstein's equations has the structure of a phase space called covariant phase space. And we can express the symplectic structure in terms of the fields of scry. And therefore, we get a phase space of radiative modes. It's again a very nice geometric construction. And the statement is that you know, we can ask, what does BMS group do? Well, it generates canonical transformations. It preserves the symplectic structure. It preserves the Poisson bracket. Mathematics literature, we have a nice momentum map from the BMS group into uh, from, from the phase space into the dual of the BMS group, if you like. So these are the we can ask for the canonical transformations, and then therefore we can ask for the Hamiltonians, which generate the BMS transformations. And in particular, we can do it for translations and, and for, for space translations, time translations and space translations. And what we find is that, in fact, the generator of the time translation is just so, the, so these give us fluxes. Yeah, we are just at two minutes, so let's stop. These provide fluxes of. So supposing you give me a portion of scry, which you just write up here. Supposing you give me a portion of scry, you can even give me as a cross section. Supposing you give a portion of scry like that, bounded by cross section C1 and C2, let's call it delta scry. And I would like to know how much gravitational energy is, how much energy is carried by gravitational waves through this little region of scry here. You know, for some finite amount of time and in all angles, how much energy is emitted by gravitational waves. And the formula we know obtain is that the energy to this delta scry is just integral of an a b squared and this is the volume element of scry so this is d du times sine theta d theta d phi or delta scry or if you like this is just equal to the news tensor that is given up here, like you can put not here, square times d theta square. And the momentum in the alpha direction, or in the i direction if you like, alpha i, alpha, alpha 1 is this, alpha 2 is this, alpha 3 is this, let's call it alpha i. So this momentum through delta sky is just given by, um, by alpha i. So there is very beautiful interplay between geometry and physics. Geometry tells us that we should be looking at curvature tensor of these d's, and indeed you do that, and you look at the conformally invariant part, and that is in the, in the body news up here. And the statement is that when you compute that, can construct the Hamiltonian framework to calculate the formula for energy and momentum, they are just given by the square of the new of the new tensor and square of the new tensor vetted by the first three 
spherical harmonics. So that's what we get. Okay. So basically, that, that, is the, that is where we are. That is why there's a beautiful interplay between geometry and physics. Okay. The only thing that is left for, from full general relativity point of view is to relate this to the radiation field that's sky in terms of the white tensor that we saw before. And again, we'll see that can be constructed completely from the curvature tensor up here. So the universal structure is common to all space-time. The derivative operators vary from one space-time to another. And the derivative operators carry the information about the uh, gravitational waves. There are two radiative modes. From one space-time to another, I'll get different derivative operators. How many different derivative operators can I get? Well, as many as there are these sigmas. And these sigmas have information in interpretation of shear if you produce in introduce a cross section, and then construction gives you a whole bunch of cross family of cross sections. The shear of this cross section is what is containing the information about radiative modes. In stationary space times, you can always find cross sections such that the shear is zero. So your derivative operator, if you like, is just a trivial derivative operator up here. But in general, that's not the case. And then the energy carried is completely given by square of the curvature. Uh, of the of D uh, using uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, the square of the conformally invariant part of the curvature of the stability object. So it's very, very nice geometric framework. If you have questions, please stop by in the office hours uh, about today or on Friday. And again, today there will be a homework on the, uh, it will be shorter than the previous homeworks because there are two homeworks. The first one will be, will be due a week from today, second one will be due two weeks from today.